All right, welcome back. We are talking about, um, we're in chapter two right now. Um, last time we finished up talking about nomenclature with molecular compounds, ionic compounds, and diatomics. And then today we're going to just keep going with chapter two and um, hopefully get into chapter three a little bit. So we talked about forming molecular molecules, naming molecules. We talked about forming ionic compounds and naming them. But what we didn't talk about was the actual ion list. So I want to show you that um, before we get any farther. So here is the ion list for AP chemistry. Um, it's a little bit more extensive than what you saw in chemistry. But what you're going to notice is the ions that we actually use in this course are really repetitive. Um, you know, these are the ones that are technically fair game, but as we go through practice problems and examples in homework and labs, you're gonna see the same ions come up again and again and again. And that's because those ions are really common, relatively inexpensive, and also there's, uh, there's a new movement toward green chemistry, thankfully. So uh, most of those really common ions that you're, you're gonna see are fairly safe to store, to dispose of, all of that stuff. So um, now as you look at the sheet, I wanna show you what you need to know and what you don't need to know. So um, if we look at the cations over here on this side, you don't need to know any of these alternative names. This is the old way of naming. So the, um, the way of naming that's pretty accepted here is on this side. Um, you guys had to deal with a lot of these uh, in chemistry already. Um, the ones that you didn't deal with in chemistry, you're going to have to put some elbow grease into learning them. But again, those worksheets that I talked about, um, they, if you just make yourself go through them, go through them, go through them, you're going to get so sick of looking up them up. You're all, you're going to memorize them eventually. The other way to memorize these that I would really advise, um, because I'm not like a rote memorization kind of a person, I'm a patterns memorization kind of, kind of a person. So if you take a blanks uh, periodic table and you write them all in, you're gonna notice that certain patterns appear. And some of those patterns are for really good reasons. The, there's definite patterns in the valence electrons and the structures and and as we start to talk about like molecules and their geometries, you're gonna see the reason for some of those patterns. Um, but writing all these ions out onto a periodic table and looking for those patterns will help you remember some of them also. Now, if we look at the um, anion side over here, this one's a little bit trickier. So anything that's like hypoite, eight per eight, like the bromates, the chlorates, um, the iodates down here. Those are ones that you are going to want to know. You don't need this side. So it's almost opposite from the monatomic ions. But then um, things like you'll see here bicarbonate. So bi means that you're going to take carbonate and you're going to add a hydrogen ion to it. And so the you get HCO3 and then the plus and the two minus combine to form a minus. So that's what that's what this prefix bi means bicarbonate means they have added that a hydrogen ion has been like assimilated to the carbonate um, ion. Now bicarbonate is a pretty common ion that you're going to see, um, but so is hydrogen carbonate. So both names will probably be used. I think hydrogen oxalate is a little bit more common than binoxalate but this is a pretty obscure ion anyway that you're probably not gonna see a whole lot of. 
so this group down here with the um, anything that starts with a buy that you will see both ways on those um, per manganate you will see not manganate seven oxalate you're gonna see now this is an interesting one this is actually the organic naming system which we will go through in maybe the next slide um, and so oxalate is more common unless you are an organic chemist and then the ethyndioate is the one you're going to see now we are not organic chemists we are inorganic chemists in this class so we'll talk about like what that eth means um the prefix means but you don't have to know this one for this class uh acetate much more common ethanoate this again is from the organic naming system so we'll talk we'll kind of break that down a little bit here but you don't actually have to know that one either. Um, one other thing I wanna walk you through with the ions is something we talked about in chemistry. And that is how if you know the ATE form of things, you can figure out the whole family of hypo, it, eight per eight family. So <clears throat> we talked about how there's a section on the periodic table and we called it the table of eight. Okay. So, uh, the first box is going to have carbon in it. Then nitrogen below nitrogen is phosphorus, sulfur, and chlorine. So <clears throat> this is just a section I'm pulling straight off of the periodic table. Now, all of these are going to be oxy anions. So they're all going to contain oxygen and they're all going to be anions. So let's put oxygen into all of these. And then they're anions, which you know is going to have a negative charge. Now, the oxygens come with a pattern and the anions come with a pattern, which is why we draw this table because it is so patterned that it helps us remember. Um, the ions and you don't just have to like rote memorize them. So everything on the top is going to get uh, three oxygen. So CO3 and O3. Everything on the bottom is going to get four oxygens. PO4, SO4, ClO4. And then the anions come with a pattern too. The charge is sequential. So NO3 is a minus. CO3 is a two minus. The bottom sequential as well, ClO4 minus, SO4 2 minus, PO4 3 minus. So in this little table, on the periodic table, the um, oxygens come with a pattern, the charge comes with a pattern, which helps you remember them. And then it's the table of eight. It's kind of a play on words. You have both eight boxes, but all of these end in eight. So this in the first box is carbonate. Second box is nitrate, PO4 3 minus phosphate, SO4 2 minus is sulfate. Now this one with chlorine, it's not actually chlorate. So this one is a little bit different. This one is actually per chlorate. <clears throat> so a little bit of a catch there that you have to remember if you're going to use this memorization technique. Now, this is just kind of like a trick to help you to memorize some of these. If you know this table and you know the family naming system, you actually can have 20 ions memorized just like that. So here, if you can draw this table, you have five ions memorized. And then let me show you the family system that we talked about in chemistry also. So per eight, 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 hypo, eight. Okay, so each one of these is going to be your eight form. Notice the eight form is not consistent. You can have an eight form with four oxygens you can have an eight like sulfate 
you can have an 8 form with three oxygens, like nitrate. You can have an 8 form with a negative 1 charge, like nitrate. You can have an 8 form with a 2 minus charge, like sulfate, or a 3 minus charge, like phosphate. So the, the 8 form is not super consistent. However, if you know the 8 form, then this, this moving within this family system is extremely consistent. So the if you know the 8 form, let's just use nitrate for our first example. So nitrate is NO3 minus. If I want per nitrate, then I'm going to add one oxygen, but don't touch the charge. Remember, these are, these are ions, but the bond within nitrate, the bond between that nitrogen and oxygen, it's a bond between two nonmetals. So the bonding between the nitrogens and the oxygens is actually a, more of a covalent bond, which is why you can add an oxygen and not change a charge. You're not adding the ion of oxygen. You're adding an oxygen and redistributing the electrons. So we're going to add one oxygen, NO4, keep the charge the same. That would be per nitrate. Now, if you take an oxygen away from the 8 form, so NO2, keep the charge the same, you get nitrite, NO2 minus. And then if you take another oxygen away, so NO, keep the charge the same, NO minus, you get hyponitrite. So the difference between all these forms is just a matter of oxygens. Same thing works with all of the families. If you look at the bromate family up here at the top, okay, bromate is BRO3 minus O. Well, let's use a different one for an example because uh, that's the same as nitrate. Iodate, same number of oxygens, same charge as nitrate. Chlorate, here we go. All right, the chlorate family. So chlorate oh, is the same. <laughs> NO3 minus. All right, let's use one off our table. SO4, 2 minus. That's the sulfate form. So if we want per sulfate, we add an oxygen, SO5, 2 minus. Uh, if we want the sulfite form, you're going to take an oxygen away, charge the same. And then if you want the hyposulfite form, you're going to take another oxygen away, charge the same keep the charge the same. So all of these families work in the exact same way. So you don't actually have to memorize all four, four iodine ions. You just need to know the eight form and you can figure all the other ones out. You don't actually have to memorize all of the bromate ions. You just have to, to memorize the eight form and you can figure out the other three. So hopefully that helps you guys a little bit. Again, those are just memorization tricks. If you have another way of memorizing it and you don't want to use that trick, you certainly don't have to. Memorize it any way you want to memorize it. All right. So we have talked about naming molecular compounds. We have talked about ionic compounds. Um, remember the diatomics are elemental forms, um, and they are going to exist in that seven on the periodic table, uh, plus hydrogen. There are a couple other elements that aren't monatomic elements. The ma vast majority of elements are going to be monatomic. There's those seven elements that are going to be diatomic. Sulfur and phosphorus actually have a couple forms also. So if you ever see elemental sulfur, in a reaction, you can write it as S. You can also write it as S8. And then phosphorus is the same way. Uh, you can, for elemental phosphorus, you can write it as a P. Um, a more proper form would be P4. Uh, so again, vast majority of 
of elements are monatomic elements, like carbon is monatomic. Uh, I don't know, silicon's monatomic. Um, seven diatomics, and then sulfur and phosphorus also have a couple forms. I mean, carbon has a couple forms too. The the most common way you're going to see it is C, but graphite has its own form. Uh, like coal would have its own form. Diamonds have its own form. I believe diamonds are C60, something like that. So there's a couple other forms for elements that you're going to see out there. Um, but you don't technically need to know them. I just want you to be aware that they also exist so you don't feel lied to later on in your chemistry career. There we go. Okay, acids. Let's review acid naming. Um, and then I also wanna talk about bases. Actually, let's talk about bases first. So bases, remember, are gonna be any compound that is a metal combined with a hydroxide. So metals can be M plus or two plus or three plus. If you combine any of these with hydroxides, what you're technically gonna get is a base. Um, now, when you name bases like NaOH or MgOH2 would both be good examples of bases, you're actually not going to use any special naming system. They are bases, yes, they are also ionic compounds. So you're just gonna name them as ionic compounds. This first one, you name the cation, then the anion, sodium hydroxide. This one, also name the cation, name the anion. So it's just magnesium hydroxide. So bases, it's good for you to be able to recognize that it's a base, but it doesn't take any special naming system. Acids, on the other hand, do take special naming systems. So acids um, are going to be anything that starts with a hydrogen. If you ever see a hydrogen in front of a molecule, the molecule probably either is an acid or can act like an acid. And you're going to want to name it in most cases um, using the acidic nomenclature. Now, uh, every Every class I get the question, well, what about water? Water starts with a hydrogen. Does that make it an acid? And actually it does. Uh, water can act as an acid. It doesn't always act as an acid. It depends on what it's around, but water actually can act as an acid. We'll talk about that more when we get into like equilibrium, acids and bases. Um, obviously we don't name it as an acid. We're going to name it as a molecule or just use its common name as of water, but yeah, it can act as an acid. Okay. So when you're dealing with, um, acids, you want to look at the prefix. So if your, um, the ion that the hydrogen is attached to, can end in id, eight, or ite. Those are your three options because hydrogen is a positive ion and positive ions are always going to be attracted to negative ions. And the only three possible endings for negative ions are id, eight, and ite. So you have to look at the name of the ion hydrogen is attached to, and that is what gets changed to name it as an acid. So you're going to drop the ide form, and then you're going to add hydro to the beginning, and then ic to the end. So this is the chloride ion. So it would be hydrochloric acid, hydrochloric acid. This is the sulfide ion. So you're going to, it's going to be hydrosulfuric acid. If it ends in eight or ite, eight does not have a prefix and it's going, going to end in ick. Ite also does not get a prefix. It's going to end in us. So if you have like, like, let's talk about the chlorate family, for example, 
So we, ha we could have HClO4, HClO3, HClO2, HClO. So in the first one, hydrogen is attached to perchlorate. So perchlorate would become perchloric acid. Notice that this one, this ion starts with the prefix per and you just keep it. Uh, the second one, ClO3, that ion is going to be chlorate. So this would be chloric acid. This one down here, ClO2 is the chlorite ion. So the acid will become chlorous acid. And then down here, we actually have hypochlorite ion. So you're going to keep the hypo um, prefix, and then you're going to add us to the end. So it'd be hypochlorous acid. Uh, this would be another good one that would be really great to practice. Um, and we'll go through one of these examples in class also. Okay. Um, organic naming. So an organic compound is any compound. Uh, it's a carbon-based compound. So if you look at the compound, the main chain that's present is going to be made out of carbon. So the reason there's uh, a whole naming system for these is because it's such a big class of molecules. Anything that is living, was living, will be living is going to be a carbon-based compound. So you are a carbon-based compound. Isn't that exciting? And that's why like ancient animals and plants that died and decomposed under pressure in the ground or under the ocean turn into petroleum-based compounds because carbon-based life forms are going to turn into carbon-based fuel. Um, and that's exactly what an organic compound is. So it's going to, your main chain is going to be carbon. A lot of times the things that are stuck to carbon are hydrogens, but you can also have other things stuck onto carbons. Um, there's a whole bunch of things you can stick onto carbons. So uh, when you are naming organic molecules, it's kind of a three-step process. So the first part of naming organic um, molecules is that you have to determine how many carbons there are. So this is number one. It's determined by the number of carbons. So uh, the beginning of your name will tell you how many carbons are involved. And so you will look for things, words, prefixes like meth, Eth, prope, but, uh, pent, hex, hept, uh, oct, non, deck, nobody ever knows 11, dodec, so meth would be one carbon, eth would be two, prop would be three, but is four, pent is five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, oh, nobody knows, eleven, and then twelve. Okay, so after five, it gets very normal, right? But before five, uh, these, are, these are prefixes that we are not used to seeing. You know, we're used to seeing things like, I mean, even like, mono, di, tri, tetra is a little bit weird in geometry. Um, you know, the, the prefixes that we use in geometry, like um, di, tri, quad, those would be more common. So organic naming systems, a little odd, um, but it's the beginning of the word that you're going to look for to tell how many 
carbons. And if you think about different fuels that you use, we're actually pretty familiarized with these um, with these terms like methamphetamine tells you um, a little bit about the structure of that molecule. Something about the amphetamine is that there's there's going to be one of them, or like meth methane has one carbon, methanol has one carbon. So methane is a super flammable liquid. Um, methanol is found in, it's a type of alcohol and it's found in things like mouthwash. Uh, fun fact, it will make you go blind if you drink it. So don't drink mouthwash. Um, same thing with F, like you've probably heard of ethane or ethanol. Uh, again, you're going to, you're talking about like a fuel and alcohol propane is going to be the, um, fuel that you find like in your grill. Butane is going to be the fuel that you find inside like a butane lighter. Um, a lot of like the little pocket lighters or the, the click lighters that you use for like lighting campfires or lighting grills. A lot of those are filled with butane. And all of these words are really describing the number of carbon that's in the chain of this fuel or this alcohol or this carboxylic acid or whatever you're talking about. So that's the first thing to look at. The second thing is the ending. Um, the ending tells you about the bonding. <clears throat> so for example, ane, A-N-E is going to tell you that you have a single bond. E-N-E, <clears throat> E-N -E, is going to tell you that you have a double bond and E-N is going to tell you you have a triple bond. So for example, if we look at propane, propane is going to have three carbons stuck together. Um, the carbon chain has to be able to be drawn without uh, raise, without lifting your pen. If, if it is broken, if your carbon chain is broken like this, for example, it's no longer going to be propane because the longest carbon chain you can draw is two. Then I have to lift my pencil to get to the other carbon. So this would not be an example of propane. It'd be an example of like an F-based molecule. Okay, so coming back to propane. Propane is going to have three carbons right in a row. Um, it's, it's going to end in ane. So let me write this out. Propane. Okay. It's going to end in ane, which means that these bonds that you see are both going to be single bonds. And then if you remember from chemistry, carbon has to have four bonds attached to it. So remember carbons... Lewis dot diagram looks like this. It has four electrons, but it needs to gain four other electrons in order to be stabilized. So you're going to form four bonds, whether carbon forms four, bond, four single bonds like this, or carbon forms two double bonds like that. This, it's always going to be surrounded by four total bonds. So every carbon up here needs one, two, three more bonds. So this carbon on the end has one bond already. It needs one, two, three more. And these things that are bonded to it are going to be hydrogens. Um, this carbon in the middle already has two bonds. And so it just needs two more bonds. Again, bonded to hydrogens. And then carbon on the end has one. It needs three more bonds. So that is going to be the structure of propane. Now, um, when you get into organic chemistry, you're going to start drawing so many carbon and hydrogen atoms that you get really sick of drawing carbon and hydrogen atoms. And so you may start to see molecules that look like this. They're drawn like this, or sometimes they're just drawn like that. So at each end of your curve is going to be a carbon and then organic chemists just get super lazy and they don't even draw on the hydrogens that, that exist on there. So you can look forward to drawing a molecule that looks like this someday.
lucky you. All right, so we have talked about two parts of naming our molecule, like named by the number of carbons, it would be the first thing. Um, thinking of the ending would be the second thing. And then the third and final thing is going to be functional groups. So if we go to this little poster, which I will send to you, this little poster is poof, all the functional groups in organic chemistry. Okay, so what you're, this is a little confusing at first because there's lots of letters and numbers and stuff like that. So let me show you around a little bit. When you see an R, an R is a carbon chain. So that could be one carbon, that could be two carbons, that could be three carbons, so on and so forth. So instead of limiting themselves. They want to make it really general. It's almost like they take this half, the left half of the, of the molecule, and they give it a variable. They just call it R. And then the second part of the molecule, which is very specific, they leave as the specific thing that it is. So anytime you see an R, that, that can be any carbon chain from one carbon to thousands of carbon. Um, they're just leaving it very general like that. Okay, other things you might see are actual carbons like this one. You might see oxygens, nitrogens, hydrogens, sulfurs. Um, now X, let me talk to you about X a little bit. X's that you see, like here too, those are going to be halogens. So fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, probably one of those halogens. Um, and you can substitute any of those halogens in for X. Come on, buddy, erase for me. Oh no, what did I do? <laughs> I can't erase. All right. Okay. The other, the last thing that you're going to see, notice that some of these have like double, triple bonds. Some of them have single bonds. Some of them have double bonds. So uh, they all have their like very specific bonding that's occurring. And then down here is the last thing that you're going to see that's kind of interesting. So this is what I'm talking about. Organic chemists get super lazy because they write so many carbons and hydrogens. Eventually they just write them as uh, shapes. And so at each of these points, one, two, three, four, five, six, is gonna be a hydrogen. And then coming off of all of those hydrogens, one, so this, ha this carbon already has one, two, three bonds. So this needs one hydrogen, one hydrogen, one more. They all just need one more hydrogen, which they don't draw they assume that you know that they need one more hydrogen. Okay. Let me close this and open it again and see if I can see if it comes up clean. It does. Awesome. Okay. So there's a couple of these that you should know that I would like you to uh, memorize because they come up so often. So here are the ones I want you to know. Notice that in the beginning, alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes, they're just showing you the difference between one bond to a double bond and a triple bond, a single bond, a double bond, and a triple bond. And then they give you examples of Notice that this has two carbons. So anything that looks like this would be ethane. This one also has two carbons and a double bond. And so that would be ethene. Two carbons and a triple bond would be ethine. So I'm going to expect that you know these because it's part of the naming system. Number of carbons, what type of bond is in there, functional group. Okay, you should know an alcohol. We deal with alcohols all the time in inorganic chemistry. Methanol, uh, ethanol, propanol, butanol. Um, 
we deal with alcohols all the time. So you should definitely know uh, the alcohol. So to make something an alcohol, what you do, like ethanol is the example they're using. So this would be, I'm actually going to drop the hydrogen. See, I'm sick of drawing hydrogens already. I'm going to drop, oh, well, I guess for the sake of discussion, I should draw them. Okay. So in this case, I'm going to drop a hydrogen and replace it with an OH group. So this molecule um, with the OH group attached, that would be an alcohol. Because it has this OH functional group attached to the molecule, um, that's what makes it an alcohol. And so when, in order to know, to let your readers know that you're dealing with an alcohol, you want to add an ending. So here's the ending. If we go back over here, it's going to end in OL. So you take the base word F for the two carbons, AN for the single bond, and then ALL for the functional group that's attached. So it becomes ethanol. Uh, it's I love it. I love this naming system because it's just packed with information. Okay, so definitely no alcohols, definitely no carboxylic acids. Um, we deal with those a lot also. One of, our, one of our most common weak acids, which is acetic acid, is actually a carboxylic acid. So if you go back to that ion list and find acetic acid, its other name is ethanoic acid down here. Um, what else are you going to run into? Let's, okay, how about an amine? I want you to know an amine. Um, and we're going to call it there for now. If you were, if we were kind of spending more time in organic chemistry, other ones I would want you to know would be like, um, ethers, esters, amides, aldehydes, ketones, and maybe thiols. Yeah, that's a pretty good list right there. So if you knew those one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, you're going to, you're going to be able to deal with like 99% of all organic compounds. Um, but in inorganic chemistry, really, we don't deal with a whole lot of inorganic compounds, but we do deal with a ton of alcohols, carboxylic acids, and maybe even a, a few amines. So knowing those three um, and being able to draw out the molecule and be, be able to name the molecule with those three functional groups either attached or not attached is going to give you a pretty good understanding in, in AP chemistry. So here's the deal. Um, this is beyond the scope of our class. Uh, the test, the AP chemistry test, will not test you on your ability to name or draw organic compounds, but they will use them, uh, which is kind of crazy to me. It's, uh, it's definitely one of the ways that they stretch you. So like, for example, in a free response question, they might throw out the name um, ethanoic acid. They're just going to use it and move on in life. And that using that name of a molecule that, you know, the majority of chemistry students aren't familiar with is enough just to start panicking people. And then people like their mind just goes blank and then they can't function on the test anymore. Or another year, what they did, actually, this is really common. They do this all the time. They'll put up two um, forms of an organic molecule and then they'll ask you a whole bunch of chemistry inorganic chemistry questions off of them but just the fact that the compound is an organic compound the name is an organic name is enough just to make people's minds go blank and they panic and then they totally like can't answer questions from that point on so 
the AP chemistry text references organic molecules all the time. So I want you to be knowledgeable and functionable and able to uh, see these molecules and just, uh, you know, have this basis of understanding and know what we're talking about <clears throat> and feel very comfortable talking about these molecules. So we're, that's why we're talking about this very basic uh, naming and being able to draw from the name kind of a deal. Um, okay. Last thing in, uh, when we're talking about organic compounds and this actually, they will test you on and it's something called isomers. So let me close this and get back to our PowerPoint. Let me see if I have a slide on this. I do not. Okay. So it's something called isomers. And what an isomer is, is two molecules that have the exact same formula, but different structure. So let me say that again. It's two molecules that have the same formula, but different structure. So uh, let me think of an example. Um, okay, butane would be a good example. So butane is going to have four carbons, C4, and that means it's going to have 10 hydrogens. Okay, so butane. I can draw butane like this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Right? four carbons, 10 hydrogens. That is this molecule. Okay. I can also draw it like this. One, two, three, four. And then I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 hydrogens. C4H10, same formula, different structure. And because the structure is different, it's going to have a different name. So check this out. I have one, two, three, four carbons. That's butane. In this one, I have one, two, three carbons or one, two, three carbons, but I can't actually get to that other carbon without lifting up my pencil and putting it down again. And so this molecule up here on the top is actually not butane. It's propane with a functional group attached. And that functional group is CH4. No, CH3, sorry. So if we go back here, Uh, the fact that functional group's actually not on this one. Okay, ignore I said that. Anyway, so it's it's a propane molecule with the CH through three functional group that's stuck onto it. So they're totally different molecules, completely different behavior, completely different functions, but they have the same formula. So these two things are what we would call isomers and they, the AP test actually will test you on isomers and it just takes a little practice. Anybody who likes puzzles or Sudoku or anything like that, um, you're going to love organic chemistry because it's all just a puzzle. Um, and this is a really good example of why, like if I give you a, um, a formula you should be able to play around with that formula and figure out how many different ways you can draw it. Now, one word of the wise, drawing something like this and something like this don't count as different structures um, because I can draw my chain any way that I want to, I can still draw my chain the same. So what you have changed or what I have changed by drawing it differently like this is I've only changed the geometry 
And actually, when molecules form, they're going to force themselves into very specific geometries, which we will talk about later. And so you drawing the geometry different on the paper is not actually a, a real change in the molecule. You actually have to be able to take one of these off and then move it somewhere else on the molecule in order to get a different molecule, which you actually cannot do with propane. You cannot, no matter where you move this carbon, you're still going to have a three carboned chain. So you can't actually form an isomer. Propane has no isomers. Okay, so that is it for this lesson today. And we'll go over a whole bunch of practice together in class. All right, have a good day. See you guys later.